Forgive me, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, as we get ourselves somewhat organized. It's the chaos when you use lots of boards. Um, Madam Speaker, we're going to sort of do something that's sort of a continuation on a theme. A couple of weeks ago, I was behind the microphones here, and something I've done a lot, and walked through just how much trouble we're in as a society. Um, the debt it's coming, and turns out that debt is not re Democrat or Republican, it's demographics. We got old. But I first want, before I start to walk through what I believe is the thought process of the solutions that actually can save us, I'm going to ask um, uh, uh, some favors of anyone who's crazy enough to give us time to watch some of this. Um, I actually do read the comments when these things are put out on social media. Um, when you look around the room, there's almost no one here. But we're on several hundred televisions right now around the campus. There's right now in offices in the buildings, there's young people working on policy papers who have this on their screen. This is part of the way we communicate with each other. There is a purpose. The second thing is I'm gonna ask, as I start to walk through these ideas, open your minds. Some of these will offend Republicans, some are gonna offend Democrats, but the math, the math is true. And the family motto, the math will always win. There's hope out there. But every single day, this place continues to operate like a clown show. And I'm sorry, that was very mean to clowns. Um, and, and, and being sarcastic, I'm being mean. The scale of, of what's coming at us and, our, and the immorality of not dealing with it terrifies me. So let's, we're going to quick recap. Next 30 years, and this is last year's CBO numbers. This is before inflation has been calculated in. We functionally have, um, and, and the newest one was 114, this one is 116 trillion dollars of borrowed money coming. And that's in today's dollars. So think about that. And this board, we're going to borrow 116 trillion dollars, or 114 trillion. We have a couple, about 1.9 trillion. We're in the positive. So where's all the borrowing coming from? Every dime of borrowing over the next 30 years, 75% of it is Medicare, 25% is a shortfall in Social Security. That's immoral. But it's math. We got old. Baby boomers started retiring. It's math, and how many conversations have happened on the floor today saying, hey, this is going to drive all public policy because it's going to consume every dollar? This is the reality. Look, we're in the process of adopting a little boy right now. He's five months old. He's been with us since his first few days of life. It is a joy. When he turns 25, we have to double his tax rate will have to have doubled what we all pay. And that is just to maintain the baseline of services. So if you think about where you're going to be 20 years from now, 25 years from now, are you ready to pay double the taxes? We make businesses actually do disclosures now saying, well, global warming, environmental change, you should have to disclose that. Damn it, should those same businesses have to disclose the fact that their tax rates are doubling over the next couple of decades? And it's baked in the cake. It is this math. Unless you have a revolution in two areas, the crashing the cost of health care and economic growth, and growth is moral. Think about the end of 2017, 18, 19, when the poor got dramatically less poor, the middle class got much more prosperous, income inequality shrank dramatically. It's moral. And this place, we're going to fight over the stupidest things because it's easy to understand, it's theatrical. And I have 100 plus trillion dollars of crushing debt coming on top of the 31 trillion that's already out there, and that's going to crush all of you. If you think you're retiring, if you think my little boy or my seven-year-old girl, when they hit their peak earning years, are going to live more prosperous than we do, 
if we do not engage in some sort of thought revolution. And that's what I'm asking everyone to give me. Just give me a little, and I'm going to do this in a couple series. So this is going to be over a couple nights. But, but I also need us to understand how dangerous debt markets are smart. If those debt markets out there where we're having to borrow trillions actually see us, hey, Congress is actually starting to take this stuff seriously, we will be benefited by the price of money into the future. Right now, they don't think we're taking it seriously. And do understand, if interest rates on US sovereign debt go up two points, in about 20, uh, my math was about 25 years, this board was actually original off a of print that said 30 years, every single dime of US tax receipts goes just to cover interest. I need you, need you to take a step back and think about that. We are piling on so much debt and the curve expands. In about a decade, we're running into almost structural $2 trillion a year deficits and it gets bigger from there. And it's demographics, almost, well, almost every dime of that borrowing, 75% will be Medicare, 25% will be Social Security. Yet around here, we'll beat the crap out of each other for even mentioning Social Security and Medicare. But to save it, it's to actually understand the math. What would happen if we don't convince debt markets that we're going to take this debt seriously and the CBO model that was, what, a year ago was, hey, the mean interest rate on U.S. sovereigns is going to be like 1.78. Now it's like 2.8. But if it remained around 4, you do realize in two decades every dime just goes to interest. This is what we're, we're, we're handing to our kids. So I also need to crush some of the stupidity out there. I accept the political class in our campaigns and those things. There's been a certain lack of truthfulness. Democrats will say, well, if we tax rich people, do you realize if you took every billionaire in America and took every dime they had, every dime, and the price of their yachts didn't crash, you took every dime you could run the government for maybe seven and a half months, now you crashes into a massive depression. The scale of this spending and the debt is, is, is just ginormous. Love that word. But also for us on the conservative side, we often have our people who get behind the microphone and say, we got rid of foreign aid. Get rid of every dime of foreign aid. Okay, last year what? I think foreign aid is about $38 billion. And let's see, last year we were borrowing um, 26 billion, 26 billion, 444 million every week. So you get rid of every dime of foreign aid, that's what, um, 10 and a half, 11 days? What are you going to do with the rest of the year? Think of that. Every dime of foreign aid, maybe 11, 12 days of borrowing. And remember, our borrowing is going to double functionally over the next 10 years. We need to tell the truth about the scale. So if I get one more person on my side, well, we got rid of waste and fraud or foreign aid, or they say, oh, we'll just tax rich people more. The math doesn't work. Great campaign rhetoric, looks good in a brochure. So you saw in the first chart, $114 trillion of borrowing, and that's last year's number before inflation, coming. There are solutions. So let's actually start to be optimistic because there is hope. But we first also have that moment of reality. Stop talking about things that are rounding errors. We should still do some of them, like price transparency. Many of us on the Republican side believe very much that you should know what the price of everything in healthcare is. Great, let's do it. But the best academic study says eh, maybe about 1%. 0 0.1 to 0 0.7 is what the academic studies say if we had price transparency, because you have a third party payer system. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but don't think it makes that big a deal in a society where I have healthcare markets around the United States that just had 16% inflation. Think of that, the healthcare costs in some of these markets went up 16%. And look, if you want to see a lot of detail, go to Brian Riddell's 
charts, Manhattan Institute, this is one of them, and it talks about all the different ideas, both particularly from the right and mostly from the left, of if we did this sort of tax, here's how much more tax we get over a decade of GDP. And you start to add it up and you start to realize none of these get you even close. You know, double the tax rate, take people, you know, and move them from, you know, 35 to 50 to 60 to 70 percent tax rates. You don't get anything. And that's without an attempt to even do the economic effects. Because there is a math reality that those ones in the tax world, I'm on ways and means, and it's for 100 plus years. When we lower taxes, we basically seem to get about that 18, 19% of GDP, the size of the economy, in taxes. When we've raised taxes in the United States, you seem to get about that 18, 19% of GDP in taxes. It's math. And you've got lots of history on this. So when you've raised taxes, we're still getting this size much of the economy, but the economy gets smaller. When you've lowered taxes, the economy gets bigger, and you get that, this percentage. It turns out that right now we're getting almost a trillion dollars more in receipts, revenues, taxes, than we were getting just a couple years ago. A lot of that is based on the growth that came after tax reform. A lot of it was the amazing amount of government spending here that we had some of that stimulus that we're going to take some taxes in on money we put out, but we still have to borrow the money, so it's just we're screwed from that. Sorry, economic term. Um, but the fact of the matter is a lot of folks who predicted, oh, revenues are going to crash, they didn't. Society got much more productive. Expensing turns out to be the most valuable thing in tax reform because it forced us to do investment and growth. And at one point, we're going to talk about that. So let's actually talk about right now the primary driver of U.S. debt over the next 30 years. Some reality, 5% of our brothers and sisters are over 50% of all of our health care spending. Now these are our, our, our friends, our neighbors, our family members who have chronic conditions, multiple chronic conditions. The majority of health care spending comes through government. The majority of this population is getting their health care through government. If this is a primary driver of cost in our society, primary driver of debt, wouldn't we think about, hey, what can we do to that 5% of our society that's out there suffering? It's worth thinking about. So if I came to you right now and said, what are ideas we have out there that are doable in divided government that won't scare people too much or won't bring the armies of lobbyists down saying, oh, we're screwing up their business model, but also have that morality of actually potentially working, doing something good. I'm going to walk, start with really simple, and we're going to get more complica complicated. What would happen, Madam Speaker, if I came to all of us and said, did you know it's estimated that 16% of all healthcare spending is people just not taking their meds? So I have hypertension. I take a calcium inhibitor. I don't stroke out because it's a, and it's a really, really cheap, cheap, cheap pill. As long as you take it, it's incredibly effective. How many people do you know take statins, you know, for their cholesterol? There are drug regimens where if you take them and take them according to the prescription, you're healthy, you're safe. But when you don't, you stroke out and that costs hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, it turns out if that's 16% of all healthcare spending, you do realize that's over a half a trillion dollars a year in healthcare spending. So why wouldn't we have a conversation around this place and saying, okay, we all walk around with these little supercomputers in our pocket. We've seen the studies now saying that people not adhering to their pharmaceutical regimen to stay stable is over 16% of healthcare spending. Why wouldn't you do something silly like a solution? Well, it turns out they have pill bottle caps that beep at you if you don't open them in the morning. So when you're really busy running around saying, oh God, I forgot to take my calcium inhibitor for my you know, hypertension, and the thing's beeping at you. And the other ones also will beep at your phone. I know this sounds silly, 
But could you imagine, instead of 16% of healthcare being the cost of people having not maintained their, we cut it in half. That's $250, $300 billion a year. And it would have been, what, a 99 cent to $2 pill bottle cap that beeps at you. Or the one that, for grandma, dispenses her mixture of pills because that's, and she's having trouble remembering it. But this, we're walking through simple ideas that actually could pass here. Why wouldn't we have this discussion? And there's other derivative discussions that make people uncomfortable, like for high-priced medicines, put them in sterile packaging so if someone passes away, they can go back to you know, um, the health co-op or whatever it is out there and reuse them. There's all sorts of these ideas. But think about something as simple as this. This is a half a trillion dollars a year For something you need, why wouldn't we invest and say, hey, put the, put the pill bottle cap on it that beeps at you if you don't open in the morning? Does this seem, is this simple enough conceptually? There's ideas like this that have massive dollar impacts, and we never even discuss them because they're simple to absorb. I've been here multiple, multiple times, and I've talked about the item you can blow into. Think, and we've, in the, our office, we've nicknamed it the flu kazoo because that was cute, people got it. But it's a breath biopsy. I showed it, um, I think, a couple weeks ago on the floor that there's all these things where you can functionally have a medical lab in your home medicine cabinet. But here's the disruption, and this is what makes so many people angry, is if I brought you something right now, for a couple hundred dollars, you could have it in your home medicine cabinet. You could blow into it, instantly tell you have the flu, instantly bang off your medical records, instantly order your antiviral, and a Lyft or Uber could drop it off at your house in two hours. Wouldn't you like that? For everyone here who talks about accessibility, you know, remember I just talked about having a little person at home? It's a lot easier to blow into that thing for the breath biopsy and get the prescription delivered than it is to go wait in an emergency room or try to get that doctor's appointment. But believe it or not, that technology is illegal. The way our laws are set up right now, that disruptive technology is illegal. It's crazy. But why wouldn't you allow that algorithm that statistically is more accurate than a human write a prescription? Would it make your life better? Madam Speaker Pro Tem, may I ask my time? Any? Excellent. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. So this is part of what we're talking about, is legalize the technology that will make our lives easier, better, faster, raise accessibility, and yes, it's going to cause a disruption. If you're the investor in the urgent care system, you may not like telemedicine. You may not like these things, but, but how many of us used to go to the Blockbuster video? and stand in line and have the nice person hand us a suggestion on a, on a movie because the one we really wanted wasn't there? If they'd hired enough lobbyists, would this place have slowed down the internet to keep Netflix? I need you to think this way, and this is what I'm asking anyone that's viewing, is the reality of it, when you looked at that first slide and we talked about Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of borrowing that's coming from just the shortfall in Medicare. And if this were 20 years ago or 25 years ago, you'd have this debate with the left or the right. Well, we're going to do entitlement reform. No, we're not. Does anyone remember the experience that this body had back in the early 2000s when someone was willing to talk about trying to save Social Security back then and it became political ads fundraising. Now, the math was true, but the politics were great to destroy then George Bush and the people who were willing to tell the truth about the math. This place will lip service, but it's not going to happen. So the path I'm proposing is embrace what we've gotten really good at in this country. I mean, 
this is a supercomputer. Think of the power it's in this thing. Yeah, it's an iPhone, it's expensive. But it's, what, 10,000 times more powerful than the old IBM PC I used to have. Take that concept, and what would happen if we would legalize technology to crash the price of healthcare? And so what's one of the biggest drivers of healthcare costs in the country? The number one, a little uncomfortable to talk about, it's diabetes. The fact of the matter is 31% of all Medicare, Medicare, not Medicaid, Medicare spending is related to diabetes. 33% of all healthcare spending is related to diabetes. It's crazy. I represent a tribal community that's actually pretty well off. They're incredibly well managed. Salt River, P.M. Maricopa in tribal community, right alongside Scottsdale, and they have gaming and sports and all sorts of other things. They're very good at what they do. And they're the second highest per capita population, I think, in the world for diabetes. And their sister tribe, um, Gila, is number one. Is it moral? If I came to you right now and said, there's a path, and yes, it might not ultimately work, but there's a path out there of a stem cell treatment that working with CRISPR where they've tagged it so you don't need anti-rejection drugs, and yes, it's type one, but there's a proof of concept that's starting to work where they've actually had a handful of Americans who they've been able to transfer the stem cells and their bodies are, their I, islet cells are now producing insulin. Remember I just told you this 33% of all healthcare spending. It's 31% of just all Medicare. It would be the single biggest thing you could do for debt. It'd also be one of the most moral things you could do for our brothers and sisters out there suffering and having their going blind and losing parts of their feet. Oh, and also there's some math out there that says health may be one of the primary drivers to income inequality in society. You can't work if you have a family member who you're having to take care of because the disease is ravishing them. This is forcing the body to think differently. That if a cure is moral, but it's also really good economics and would help us take on the primary driver of our future debt, which is health care, why wouldn't you fixate? on that 5% of our brothers and sisters that have chronic conditions that are over 50% of all healthcare spending, the 31% it's actually Medicare that's just diabetes. How about a moonshot? So if I came to you right now and said they're having some success, why can't we bring these? I've been trying now with, under Democrat control for a couple of years. And look, being in the minority, we basically get told to go to hell. But this is, and then I'll talk to my brothers and sisters on the Democrat side, and they'll go, well, that's amazing. I don't believe it. Shouldn't we actually go out and just build a whole bunch more of diabetic centers? Great, you're going to help people manage their misery. How about curing it? Isn't this the moral thing to do? Oh, and by the way, it would be the single most powerful thing you could do for U.S. sovereign debt and my five months old economic future and your retirement. This is just a taste of sort of the disruptive ideas I'm going to try to bring here over the next handful of times I get in front of the floor. There is hope, but this body needs to start thinking like that we care. This body needs to start acting like we give a damn. Instead, we spend so much time doing theater. Look, I care a lot about what's on Hunter Biden's laptop. Well, not really. I, I do care about the media hiding it and screwing up with our elections and those. Okay, that's important. Did I mention at the end of the decade or so we're going to have $2 trillion a year deficits and it goes up from there? you got to decide, are you going to save the republic? Are you going to embrace the morality of prosperity? Start understanding the science, the synthetic biology, the opportunities around us where we can cure people. Because I'm going to argue 
that finding a path whether it be the single shot cure that's now available for hemophilia, which is really expensive, but it cures hemophilia. Now we should probably come together as a body and say, hey, why don't we work out a financing mechanism so we could use the future savings to pay for um, the purchase of the drug today, because wouldn't that be the moral thing to do? Oh, by the way, it gets rid of that chronic condition. Sickle cell anemia, we are so close. There's so many things out there where we talk about the lack of productivity in society. What would happen if we cured so many of our brothers and sisters so they're able to participate in the economics? So part of this closing here, we're going to talk about sort of a unified theory to save the country. And part of that unified theory, this is the economics, is bracing the technology. And yes, disruption is scary. It may mess up your business model, but it's moral. Talking about immigration, really hard. But the fact of the matter is, importing poverty by open borders crushes the working poor because now they're who they're competing with. But we need talent. And with the fertility rates all across the Western world, the next couple decades is going to be a fight for smart people. Over here, a tax code that fixates on growth. Maybe it's time to stop subsidizing importing stuff from other countries and, and functionally taxing ourselves to send things out of the country. You do realize we functionally crush ourselves in the way we design our tax code today. Why wouldn't you flip that so you incentivize, make it here? The other thing is regulatory. If I came to you tomorrow and said, you could crowdsource air quality. You don't need buildings full of paperwork shoved in file cabinets. You could make the air cleaner, better, faster. Things like what happened to the water in Detroit or other places. Actually, it wasn't Detroit. What was the, um, sorry, I'm from out west. But you know, the little thing that you're able to sample your water or the thing you can put on your lapel that sample. I'm going to beg of us, I'm going to bring boards talking about there's technology around us where we can crush the size of the bureaucracy, get cleaner, better, faster, healthier, and grow. And the growth is moral. And the growth gives us a path to not be crushed by the debt that is coming. And with that, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, I yield back.